Good morning, everybody. My name's Oliver Gilly, and I'm going to talk to you today about vitamin D and what I call the gold standard fallacy. It's about the importance of vitamin D for health, but it's focusing on what some skeptics have been saying in the Lancet Medical Journal. Skeptics who've attacked the evidence suggesting that insufficient vitamin D is the cause of many diseases. Their attack in two articles in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology in December and January is based on a particular interpretation of gold standard clinical trials, which I believe is false, and so I've called it the gold standard fallacy. <clears throat> these, <clears throat> these are the two articles I'm talking about, published in December 2013 and January 2014. They created great controversy among scientists working with vitamin D who felt that the articles overlooked a mass of lab work, animal work, and epidemiology that established important links between insufficient vitamin D and many different diseases. The Lancet <clears throat> acknowledges observational evidence showing a strong association between low vitamin D concentrations. <coughs> Sorry. Low vitamin D concentrations and diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. However, the Lancet argues results of randomized controlled trials of vitamin D supplements in these diseases are mostly negative and concludes that vitamin D supplementation actually provides protection from few, if any, diseases. According to the Lancet, the low vitamin D in observational studies occurs because sick people do not get out into the sun, and they call this reverse causality. Here are some of the diseases associated with low vitamin D levels. As well as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, etc., we have a long list of autoimmune diseases. The Lancet believes that these diseases are all associated with low vitamin D by reverse causality because giving a vitamin D supplement is not generally effective in treating these diseases in adults. This reasoning is what I call the gold standard fallacy. Here is my definition. Gold standard fallacy is an error in reasoning which holds that lack of beneficial response to a vitamin given to adults in a clinical trial shows that lack of the supplement cannot be the cause of the disease and that low levels of vitamin are a result of reverse causality. This reasoning completely overlooks what we know very well, that early insufficiency of vitamin D can cause a lesion. While early repletion may heal the lesion, later supplementation may not do so. There are a number of very clear examples of this. Rickets may be cured completely in infancy by giving a vitamin D supplement. However, if the bony deformities are not corrected in childhood, they become fixed, and no amount of vitamin D will cure them in adulthood. But we cannot argue from a negative result of vitamin D used in treatment of adult rickets to a conclusion that low, low vitamin D levels in childhood rickets are the result of reverse causality. The same argument applies to multiple sclerosis. These brain lesions in adults with MS occur as a result of autoimmune activity triggered by insufficient vitamin D in pregnancy or early life. Giving vitamin D to adults with the lesions cannot be expected to cure the disease, although it may help. While trials of vitamin D in adult MS have produced conflicting or uncertain results, clinical trials providing vitamin D at an early critical period might still be able to prevent the disease and so prove causation in MS. One small trial of vitamin D supplementation in optic neuritis, an early symptom of MS, has already shown that the symptoms of optic neuritis may be postponed in more than half of patients given vitamin D. This supports the suggestion of a critical period when vitamin D may be effective in preventing MS and telling us the Lancet's reverse causality theory is wrong.
These two boys are helping each other with their insulin injections. Insufficient vitamin D in pregnancy and early life leads to death of the cells in the pancreas and type 1 diabetes. Giving vitamin D later cannot bring the dead tissue back. This is best described as irreversible causation, as distinct from reverse causality. Giving vitamin D in infancy can prevent development of type 1 diabetes, but once cells in the pancreas have been destroyed, it's too late. This is irreversible causation. On this slide, you can see <clears throat> the children supplemented with vitamin D had 88% lower risk of type 1 diabetes. And uh, the uh, risk of type 1 diabetes was reduced even further if the dose of vitamin D was 2,000 units a day. <clears throat> the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging follows more than 1,000 people for 50 years or more, showing how various symptoms and diseases are linked. Low vitamin D is associated with, <clears throat> with low vitamin D early in, 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 in life um, and throughout life is associated with remodeling of the heart and hypertension, according to the Baltimore study. However, providing vitamin D to adults with remodeled hearts cannot reverse heart remodeling. The Lancet would conclude from this that low vitamin D associated with heart remodeling cannot be a cause of the remodeling and subsequent heart disease. However, evidence from experiments with rats shows that low vitamin D in early life is associated with cardiac hypertrophy and chamber alterations. And so again, we have an example of irreversible causation by shortage of vitamin D in early life, rather than reverse causality. Faye Dunaway, like all film stars, avoids the sun, and now her hands show that she has rheumatoid arthritis, which is associated in various studies with low vitamin D. The rheumatologist, <coughs> me. The rheumatologists have expressed themselves in no uncertain terms about vitamin D and rheumatoid arthritis. They say, a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency has been noted in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus. And there are reports linking reduced disease activity with vitamin D supplementation. The evidence is overwhelming. The time has now come for rheumatologists and metabolic bone disorder specialists to draw up formal guidelines how best to treat vitamin D deficiency. Once again, we are seeing causation largely irreversible in adult life, not reverse causality. So why do we have all this disease caused by vitamin D deficiency? Remember the slogan, there's no such thing as a healthy tan. A generation has been taught to avoid the sun, misled by these words which never had any scientific evidence behind them. The result is that many people avoid the sun, spend more and more time indoors with TV, computers, etc. And so our vitamin D levels are very low. When I was a boy, we wore short trousers up to the age of 11 or 12. In the 1950s, boys were still wearing shorts. Now, fashions have changed, and boys wear long trousers. Girls often wear tights, even in summer, covering legs completely. So children are not only spending more time than ever indoors, they are now getting much less sun when they are outside. <clears throat> I like these pictures. Here is Louis Rayard, the French automobile engineer who invented the bikini. The bikini was a great step forward in encouraging sun exposure. On the right is the bikini Rayard invented. His mother had a lingerie business in Paris. That's how the unlikely Rayard got into 
got involved. The bikini was a great stride forwards in skin exposure, but we still have some serious inhibitions when it comes to showing our flesh. So on the beach, there's no problem. Everyone agrees that we can take most of our clothes off. On the building site, there's also no problem. Work can be very hot and it's more comfortable without a shirt. But there is a problem for men who take their shirts off in the park. Many British women, and I'm told German women too, by the way, think it's vulgar for a man to take his shirt off in the park or even in his own garden where neighbors might see him. And that's why the next picture is so interesting. Here we can see a delicate moment. Camilla, Duchess of Cornwall, wife of Prince Charles, was delighted to meet these well-toned, topless athletes in extreme hot weather as they prepared for the Delhi Commonwealth Games in 2010. The 63-year-old Duchess, protecting herself with a parasol, admired the bare-chested decathlon competitors and said, you guys look very fit. She was impressed. The press made a lot of this incident. Why? The picture showed that the Duchess was brave in confronting topless men. Many women are embarrassed and make men feel ashamed to be shirtless, except on the beach. I believe it should be possible for men to be topless without shame, and so I'm planning to launch a sun run. Here we have marathon runners in Chicago, running without shirts because it's so hot. This is healthy so long as care is taken to avoid burning. I have set up a, a not-for-profit company called Sunrun CIC, which is going to organize running events in which men who wish may remove their shirts and run topless. Women will be decently dressed in brief tops. We have plans for an event in a London park in 2015, and we're looking for sponsors. I hope that this will do something to promote greater freedom for us all to remove clothes and benefit from sun exposure. Now I'd like to finish with thanks to the many friends and colleagues who've helped me with advocacy of vitamin D issues over some 10 years. Some of them are listed here. Thank you for listening. Any questions to Dr. Gilly? I have a question. What do you recommend in winter time when you can't run topless outside? It's a little bit too cold. Well, in winter time, of course, the sun isn't strong enough to make vitamin D. So it makes sense to wear something warm. Um, but, but, but for the vitamin D? Sorry? For the vitamin D? Well, uh, uh, what, what to do about the vitamin D? Well, <clears throat> if you've had a lot of... Um, uh, sun exposure during the summer, uh, your vitamin D level could be quite high and it could last you um, uh, right through the... the well, it, it would last you through the, the whole of the winter if you, it had to, but it is advisable to take a supplement, in my view, to get the full benefit of vitamin D. So I would suggest that um, people take a supplement or um, if food is fortified, in the future, it may be that fortification of food and eating the right um, foods might uh, supply an answer, but we, we're, we're nowhere near that yet. Thank you. You recently organized a, a conference that was sponsored by Danone yeah. in London. They talked a lot about food fortification but a lot of the health writers were concerned that the food that was being fortified is actually unhealthy to start with, like cereals that have high sugar content. And the concern was that fortification of poor quality food actually has more damage. 
Do you have any comment on that? <coughs> well, I, I think that's an interesting point, but uh, uh, it's, it's adding vitamin D to uh, high sugar food isn't making it any worse. So I wouldn't be uh, against them uh, doing that. I think we just have to try and get more fortification of more foods. And um, I don't think the industry is going to move very fast on this. Uh, uh, they do seem to be moving, but in order to get fast movement, we need to get the government behind it. And uh, uh, the government has all sorts of worries, which I think are totally unrealistic. Why should it be worried about fortifying milk when they've had fortified milk in the United States and, and, and a number of other countries for many years and uh, there are, there's no suggestion that there's any problems with that. I don't see why we can't just go uh, straight away and move on to fortified milk and the, the, the government, if the government said they'd like to see more fortified milk, they could do various things to encourage it and encourage other fortification of, of other food. I'd like to see fortification of bread, actually. A lot of people don't drink milk. <clears throat> Thanks for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned uh, Boniol and, and Autier. They, these guys work together. And of course, we disagree with Boniol, like you. But um, Autier, on a certain moment, said something interesting, and I've seen that also from other scientists afterwards, that he called vitamin D, uh, in, in some diseases at least, a marker of sufficient, or too much, maybe in his case, of, of sun exposure. What, what is your view? That could be the case? <clears throat> Not for all, but for some. There are some, some, been some very interesting reports which suggest that uh, uh, sun exposure as a separate factor from the amount of vitamin D that it produces uh, is, is beneficial to health. And I, I think we'll probably be hearing a lot more about this um, in, in, in the future. Um, uh, I don't know that I can say much more than that, but uh, uh, sunshine is incredibly beneficial. We just need to uh, be cautious about utilizing it and not overdoing it. Of course, all in moderation, but at least sunshine is taking care of vitamin D itself. But beyond vitamin D, it, it is doing also other beneficial things, it seems. I, I agree absolutely. I think you're, I think you're right, and I think, I think the whole, the whole uh, view of um, sunshine and vitamin D is slowly changing. But uh, it's interesting how <coughs> different factions of scientists uh, uh, are building up their case, and we we saw an explosion of the, uh, in the Lancet in the, with these two papers. I, I think of it as an explosion from one side of indignation uh, against uh, the other side. Uh, but this is gonna, it's gonna continue, it's festering, it's not, gonna, it's not, it's not over yet. So if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation, Dr. Gilly. And uh, we see you again in the afternoon then. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.